Prologue The Tale of Narcissus and Echo As Interpreted by Terence Reel Narcissus, a cold-hearted, beautiful youth, falls in love with no one, though many are entranced by him. The great goddess Hera hears the complaints of her love-struck nymphs and decides to punish the young man for his pride. One day, while out hunting, Narcissus stumbles upon an enchanted well where he gazes upon the most seductive face he's ever laid eyes on. Each time he grasps for it, the beautiful image dissolves. Unable to sleep, eat, or withdraw, he pines, frozen to the spot, until he dies of thirst and hunger. Narcissus is an emblem of disconnection. He stands rooted over the well, not because he has too much self-love, but because he has far too little. It is not his self he is bewitched by, but his image. Narcissus at the well stands for any man more in love with his accolades, his performance, his stock options, than his own being. Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings. If you're new, feel free to take a look around. Yes, 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 the vibe. Okay, now I just want to say before we start this that I need y'all to come at this video with as open a mind as possible. I am not caping for incels. I'm not making excuses for bad male behavior. I have spent a good part of my life being around cis, straight, and gay men. I mean, apart from being related to them and being friends with them, I too, for a time, was fully heterosexual. Weird. 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 I've seen lots of different kinds of men and lots of different sides of them, as I'm sure you have. I've been hurt by them emotionally, physically, I've been frustrated by them, I've been disappointed by them, they've gotten on my damn nerves. I felt a lot of things towards men, as you'll see, and so do the authors that I'm going to talk about in a couple of these books. And me and these authors, these authors and I, I and these authors. I only have half an English degree. What, what do you want from me? The thing we all have in common is that we want to see men change and see everyone else allow men to change. We want there to be a reconciliation between all genders, one where we invite men in from the cold, emotionless tundras of their psyches and ask them to feel with us. So with all that out of the way, sit down because I want to tell you a story though. Are you comfortable? Perfect. So about nine months ago, I hung out on maybe four separate occasions with this dude that I had a brief love affair type connection type thing with. And I mean, the first date was like four hours of chat, no small talk, walking home in the snow, and a really nice first kiss. It was cute. He was a very active listener, and we could talk about anything. It was kind of like knowing someone for a while. He stimulated me intellectually, and more importantly, he was just as, if not more curious than myself. Now you're probably wondering. Well, Khadija, if the guy was so great, why did you stop seeing him? Well, to be honest, I wasn't actually sure what I wanted, which is kind of a cop-out way of me saying that I think I liked him more than he liked me and got embarrassed. So I just like stopped talking to him and blocked him on Instagram. How <laughs> woo! But one night before the blockation, we were hanging out after we had gone to the park. We were having one of our many philosophical conversations and ended up on the topic of men. As we laid there, he began to talk about his curiosity with why men suffered so much. Now, feminist fist bumping me gave him a bit of a side eye because, um, go <laughs> what? But he continued. He talked about how men experience more violence than women, about how men suffer from mental illnesses at alarming rates, about how men across racial and ethnic lines experience higher rates of murders, especially by strangers, and as all of this was happening, I was horrified. I laid there thinking, did I just go to the park multiple times with a men's rights activist? Has he been this way the whole time? Khadija, this is why you wait till you're married to go to the park. But I dared not say those things out loud. 
I let him continue to go on and on about the plight of men, all the while feeling the rage from my female ancestors telling me to kick this colonizer out of my bed. I mean, off my park bench. Out of my bed. Yeah. This metaphor doesn't work anymore. In the days after that conversation, some weird haze fell over me. I just kept wondering about men's rights. That's a lie. I have a Scorpio moon, so the only thing on my mind was vengeance. I wanted to pay him back for making me sit through 10 minutes of him talking about how much men suffer. I wanted more than anything to prove him wrong. So I went to the internet and started Googling stats about male violence and comparing them to those of especially black women. And to my dismay, some of the information he said was right. I couldn't believe it. Men were more likely to suffer from violent assault, more likely to be murdered by a stranger, and on and on it went. So then I started to wonder, what the heck is up with men? Pigs and sexist and they exhibit toxic masculinity, which is, that's a hilarious expression. Because you need to thank toxic masculinity for all the bridges, all the all the jets, all the rockets, all this toxic masculinity. Now we hear this term all the time, but what exactly does it mean? I found a lot of definitions, but the one or ones that I seem to have settled upon is that it's actually just a set of behaviors or beliefs that include, but are not limited to, suppressing one's emotions or masking distress, maintaining an appearance of hardness and violence as an indicator of power. Now, funny enough, this term was actually coined by the mythopoetic men's movement of the 80s and 90s as a reaction to second wave feminism. Men were fighting back against this belief that society was trying to feminize young boys, but also that society was trying to like hypermasculate them. So this is actually a list of behaviors considered to be toxic to masculinity uh, written by one of the leaders of the mythopoetic men's movement, Shepard Bliss. But we'll talk more about that movement in a little bit. Needless to say, toxic masculinity in general is masculinity at its ugliest. Masculinity gone awry. It's like the Enneagram that lets you know what you are when you're at your worst, like what number you are when you're at your... <sighs> toxic masculinity is the yang, is the hand, is manhood but at its worst. And yes, these behaviors are immature and don't allow for real connections and all the things, but I feel that for a while, we've just kind of like thrown the words toxic masculinity around without understanding that it's actually a symptom of a much larger disease known as patriarchy. I intend to make my own way in the world. No, well, no, no one makes their own way, not really. Least of all a woman, you'll need to marry well. Now patriarchy is a social system in which men hold the power. I'll explain why I'm using air quotes later as well. It's a system in which men use this power to dominate in roles of political leadership, moral authority, and social privileges. But there's also so many small things that women have to put up with every day that we don't even realize. They're called microaggressions. Is that true? At least that's what Wikipedia told me. But, as family therapist and author Terence Real describes it in his book, How Can I Get Through to You, patriarchy can be divided into two categories, political patriarchy and psychological patriarchy. Political patriarchy fits the above definition the best. It's the outward sexism that has been the focus of a lot of feminist writing. In white America, in white America, <laughs> in America, White women, on average, make 82 cents to every white man's dollar, with that wage gap increasing depending on your race slash ethnicity. Canada, you ain't exempt from this either. Political patriarchy is... It's men leading the helm in the multi-billion dollar beauty industry directed at women. It's Kamala Harris being the first woman to become vice president a hundred years after women were given the right to vote. And it's like well over 200 years that America has been a democracy. It's, it's bullshit. But you know what's actually scarier? <sighs> Psychological patriarchy resides in the mind, which to me is why it's more dangerous. It's less obvious, less outwardly manipulative. It's not physical abuse, but it don't feel right. As Real describes it, psychological patriarchy is a dynamic of qualities being masculine or feminine, where half our human traits are exalted while the other half are devalued. 
Guess which traits are devalued? Guess. Just guess. Just take a little guess. Any traits seen as feminine or feminine leaning are immediately mocked out of young boys and men by all of us. Real talks about how we teach young boys and girls in complementary ways to bury themselves. In young girls, we teach complacency and deference. In young boys, we teach... What's a f Well, let's get into some factors. As boys got older, they began to tell a very different story. So they really articulate the, 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 um, the bizarre expectations we have of boys as they get older, that they should disconnect from their innate emotional acuity, their emotional sensitivity, uh, in order to become a man. Everyone goes through different things during middle adolescence. But for young boys, that's typically the age they stop talking to each other, specifically about their feelings. According to the actual experts, young boys stop opening up and as a result have no place to turn to with all of the emotions. I'm actually going to link a video below with a developmental psychologist called Niobe Way because I think that gives more in-depth explanation and you know she went to school for this shit. I didn't. I've been studying social emotional development for about almost 30 years. <laughs> Interviewing boys about their relationships, their friendships, um, the kinds of things that are important to them. As a developmentalist I I follow them over time. Middle adolescence, early middle adolescence, they tell you about a lot of love that they have for their friendships. They're very, very clear about their desire for emotionally intimate male friendships. Remember the mythopoetic men's movement I was talking about before? This was used as a way to get men together and to get men talking. According to Robert Bly, author of Iron John, a book about men, the theory goes that men never learned about how to be men because after the Industrial Revolution, their fathers weren't around to teach them and their well-meaning mothers did the best they could, but a woman can't teach you about being a man because she's a woman, duh! So in the 80s and 90s, you had men paying like 75 bucks or more to go on these retreats to connect back to their manhood with other men. Think an all boys retreat focused on spiritual connections with natural manhood, drum circles, mythological storytelling, and Jung. Lots of Jung. Before I sound like I'm hating on it, I am all for men connecting to their spirituality, but this male-centered, male-dominated movement is missing some things in my opinion. Firstly, in saying that women can't raise men to be men, it lets women off the hook for our own contributions to the patriarchy and makes some of us believe that we're incapable of raising problematic sons when all of us are capable of doing that because we all live in this world. Secondly, this movement generalizes all male experiences as being one indistinguishable journey when that simply isn't true. In my eyes, the mythopoetic men's movement is to men's liberation as the white feminist movement is to all feminism an exclusionary brand of gender rights secretly propped up through capitalism. Now before one of y'all tries it with me, when I said white feminist movement, I'm talking about white feminism, not specifically white feminist. Because in my eyes, and the view of a lot of other feminists that I have read, white feminism is more about gaining the same sort of political and economical power that men have had and being dominators as well, as opposed to actual uniting of all the genders and gender identities on a social, political, economical, whatever, ological senses, okay? So don't come at me. And also, if it don't apply, let it fly, damn girl. I mean, the retreats those men went on were more for middle-class men with disposable income. If you had 75 or more bucks, you too could go beat on some drums and cry in the forest with your dude bros. If not, too bad. Looks like you'll never get out of the clutches of toxic masculinity and therefore patriarchy as a whole should have made more money, dummy. <sighs> I'm sorry. When I talk about the patriarchy, I just get riled up. <gasps> I'm sorry. Okay, I don't want to be on the let's blame our parents for everything bandwagon, but let's quickly talk about maternal sadism and then I'll calm down. 
In The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love, feminist writer and Beyonce enemy, Bell Hooks. I see a part of Beyonce that is in fact anti-feminist, um, that is assaulting, that is a terrorist, um, in the sense of, um, especially in terms of the impact on young girls. I don't know if they're still beefing. They're probably not beefing anymore. Remember when they were beefing? Well, they weren't. Beyonce doesn't beef with anyone. She's perfect. In a chapter on male violence, Hooks talks about how women can be just as violent as men to weaker groups of people, i.e. other women, people with disabilities, old people, and children. They do this through a lot of different ways, but a big way that she talks about it is the fact that mothers stop supporting their boys. They stop protecting them emotionally in a way and rely on them to become men at early ages. And she calls this uh, more emotional violence than physical. But then you have our fathers. He said he, he had to whoop my ass so I wouldn't be soft. <laughs> yeah, that's not the real fuck up part of this party I told myself it's because he cared about me fathers perpetuate this ideal of manhood in their very actions and more specifically in their silence as young children were meant to passively accept the lack of communication from our fathers as hook says and not speak the truth of what's happening around us not speak the truth about that patriarchy our mothers will also take on this silence and maybe at times bring it to their children and there is a real quote, not a real quote, a quote from Terrence Real, where he basically says a mother will be like, here is all of my pain and shame. Keep it between us. And it's all of us being silent and complicit in this system. But anyway, so, you know, we're doomed no matter what gender we identify as just because parents are human beings and they make mistakes. But boys, Lord, I'm sorry, y'all. And again, I'm not trying to contribute to the system of hating on your parents because you know, they're human beings, like I said, and after two years of therapy, I've, I've come to see them as, as real people. They grew up in a system of patriarchy just like the rest of us, so it only makes sense that they would be part of the problem. The next problem of, of teaching men to perform their manhood. That's fun. I have no cute segue. Let's just go to the next one. I'm not ashamed of who I am, but it bothers me that I'm that way. I got an image of something that's just totally not what that is not about. I'm such a fucking um, contradiction and lie to myself. Why am I that way? Both a contradiction and a lie, whatever manlyhood is. This is deepening, and I meant to put depending. <laughs> okay. Depending on how you were raised, your parents probably wanted you to be protected and to fit in. And what better way to fit in the world than being the best kind of man you can be. Things like toughen up, man up, boys don't cry, why are you wearing your mother's heels? You know, all of those are sayings that inform how our nieces, nephews, and nibblings deal with men and how men in turn deal with themselves. So based off all the things we've talked about so far, it seems that young boys feel like they might have to act a certain way to be taken seriously as a man or even seen as a man. And that way they have to act is the direct antithesis of anything associated with young girls. See why we hate teenage girls so much. The teenage girls in this generation have an absolute shitty taste in music. And because of this, you get this one up, one down paradigm of male identity. It's a performance, an act on how they believe they should be as men because we all told them that's the way they have to do things. In Bell Hook's book, she talks about how men know that deep down, this is a performance. It's a lie and part of their anger is that they don't know how to break out of it. So they express themselves in the only two emotions we allow men to have, anger, you don't want to fight me, Tristan. Why not? Because I'll kill you, idiots. Or indifference. Oh, that makes you happy. Uh, I do backflips, but I am way too cool. On that note, it's time for a quote. <laughs> So these are mixtures from some of my favorite quotes from the book by Terrence Real, How Can I Get Through to You? I don't have a physical copy with me, but I'll just put it up here. Men are not raised to be intimate. They are raised to be competitive performers. Traditional socialization teaches young boys to filter their sense of self-worth through performance. 
The paradox for boys is that in order to be worthy of connection, they must prove themselves invulnerable, button-down warriors in the world's emotional marketplace. In the world of boys and men, you're either a winner or a loser, one up or one down, in control or controlled, man enough or a girl. Where in this setup is the capacity for love? me bald bald speaking of love for an entire year nothing i did could snap you out of what you were going through you you didn't want to talk you didn't want to go out you didn't want to have sex you didn't you didn't want me lawrence it's not that i didn't want you i just watching you get up and go to work was this daily reminder that I had nowhere to go, nothing to do. Why didn't you tell me that? I just couldn't. Now, when we have romantic partners, we put a lot of stock in the idea that they're gonna heal the wounds our parents left us with. And if you don't feel that way, good for you. But the rest of us codependent ass bitches are working through some things, okay? When you go back to parents abandoning young boys emotionally and young boys not being able to speak to each other or anyone else in a truly vulnerable way and then layer on the performance of manhood, good lord! Ah, can anyone attracted to men get to know them? <sighs> Seriously. Romantic partners are sort of like mirrors for a lot of us. That intensity of love and connection brings up way too many raw emotions for anyone to act like it's not happening. I mean, you could act like it's not happening. I've seen people do it. But being a man, and dudes, please let me know this, how difficult must it be making deeper romantic connections when you feel like you're not supposed to be that way or be vulnerable or talk intimately because that's not what men do, even though that's what humans need. What a conundrum. Ugh, Mike Tyson was right. And lady partners, we gotta talk. Because Bell Hooks calls us out. In the times that I have dated men, again, even up until this year, I was telling myself, well, I wasn't straight, but I was telling myself, absurd. Anyway, when I have dated men, I would be so frustrated that they wouldn't just tell me what they were feeling, that they wouldn't just open up. And I was justified in being annoyed. I mean, Terrence Reel's book, is called, How Can I Get Through To You? But I would get into these fights with my romantic partners and they would be teetering on the edge of opening up, but I'd get so frustrated and cry and then they'd abandon whatever emotional barriers they were getting ready to jump over and come tend to my emotional ass, sensitive ass, Taurus ass needs. Or when we'd have conversations over and over again, by the time they actually started opening up, I would break up with them a few weeks later. Now, I did feel a little bad, but <laughs> not bad enough to have stayed with them because there was only so much I could do to break through that shell. And glimpses of emotional connection weren't and are not enough for me. I have more patience now than I did back then, but I also don't even bother with people, relationships or friendships, or any kind of relationship to me, that I view as emotionally unavailable because I know that I've been that person before and I know what it's like to be with that person and I simply just don't have the mental energy to do it. But back to patriarchy and partners, sorry. <laughs> this is getting real personal on here. Because of that dominator dominated mentality that patriarchy is obsessed with, this notion seeps into our romantic endeavors and can cause a lot of problems. If you're all about having the power or control in your relationships, you care less about connection and more about being on top. If you're taught that vulnerability is only for girls and that anything that's for girls is useless to you as a man, then love and connection are fine. And even though deep down, that's what all of us really need to sustain ourselves, you're willing to, as Frank Pittman says, forego love if that's what it takes to be a boss, if that's what it takes to have power. <laughs> so you think I'm gay? No, no, I, I'm gay as hell. <laughs> Shut the hell up, man. The only is tripping. Sexuality is a spectrum. You can really do whatever you want. Yeah, that boy gay as hell. 
I'm gonna stab you all last when you get upstairs to themselves, man. Sit down. Johnny, calm down. Everyone get your the fuck up now! I know what y'all think she is, but I ain't on that shit, man. So remember how I put power in air quotes before? I did it because in Dr. Warren Farrell's book, The Myth of Male Power, he talks about how true power is measured in having control over one's life. And that if we think about it in those terms, men don't actually have power in society. And on that point, I will agree with him. You know, men are subject to psychological patriarchy to a degree that many of us will never understand. We all have it, but you know. We're focusing on men right now. But I have to say, his methodology when I was listening to the audiobook had me feeling like... What white nonsense is this? He spends most of the second chapter comparing the plight of men and their lack of control on how subservient they've had to be to women to the way black people have had to be subservient to whites and had no control over their lives. And then he also kept saying the N-word way too comfortably and i know he was maybe quoting someone but you don't need to say it to quote someone see how i didn't say it and i was quoting mm. Mm. something in the milk ain't clean and also i hate oppression olympics so comparing the plight of an, the entire male gender to the plight of the entire black race as a black woman i was just sitting there like uh fuck my drag right stop, stop leaving, leaving black, black women, women out of these conversations, conversations to make to your, your point seem more, more valid and palatable, and palatable. Uh, either way even though he says that power is actually defined as having ownership over your own life there's still this weird attachment to power this one up one down belief and i just want to know what's beyond that like why are men or all of us in general so wrapped up in this power this feels like I'm stepping into territory that science can't really answer, but I got a friend that can help. That have been being asked for for a long time. So that's why we call it the time of awakening or the time of reawakening. The time of finally consciously, not just accidentally stumbling into a good mood and getting a flat. Hello? Hey, hippie Khadija, how are you? Hi Khadija, I've told you, I now only go by moonshine. Yeah, right. Totally forgot. Listen, I'm doing a video on patriarchy, like toxic masculinity within the framework of patriarchy. And I've kind of hit my limit on how much info I'm presenting. Like, I feel like something's missing and I think it needs a spiritual touch. Feel like you can help me out? Well, I'm no expert on anything, but I'd love to help. Call me back in about three minutes. Bet. I'm go get some snacks. Toxic masculinity, where to begin? I'll start by saying that unlike the beliefs of the mythopoetic men's movement that unenlightened Khadija mentioned earlier, no one is trying to take manhood away from any of you. We're simply trying to appeal to your humanity. On a spiritual level, the foundational beliefs of patriarchy speak to a larger problem that we have within our society, and those are based upon ideologies and identifiers and the possession we think we have as a result of those things. We hold our ideologies and identifiers so close to us that we almost fold them into ourselves, so much so that our very souls are completely encased in all the things we identify as and therefore all the things we think we own. And identities are important. Our identities and ideologies inform how we treat others, how we treat ourselves, and what kind of community we find as a result. The ideas of being a man, the identity of man, are beliefs that all contribute to the illusion that goes against what the great Eckhart Tolle says. You are not your thoughts. You are the awareness of your thoughts. You and I and all of us go so beyond these vessels of flesh and bone that surround us. We are, as the scientists say, literally made of star stuff. And as such, there's a limitlessness to the bounty of who we are on the metaphysical level. But as my spiritual coach always says, humans be humaning. We put so much stake in these ideologies that they not only become what we believe in, but who we are as people. Once you identify with something too closely, it becomes you. And as a result, any attack on your beliefs is an attack on you. You are not your thoughts. You are the awareness of them. So men striving for power, possession, and dominance, things they believe men 
are supposed to believe in or possess and, and being threatened every time those ideas are threatened lets us know that some men have woven patriarchy into their very essences. And your essence was meant to roam freely, not be tied down by ideologies and identifiers. Lastly, we're all one race, the human race, and we should all remember that. Perfect timing, unenlightened Khadija. Well, we are the same person, so I kind of know when you're done. And <laughs> I'd also really appreciate it if you stop calling me unenlightened Khadija. As you wish, my goal is never to hurt you. Okay. Did you talk about that identifiers and ideologies thing you were saying the other day? Yes. What about capitalism? Did you mention that? I unfortunately couldn't fit it into this one. Okay, that's fine. Just please tell me you didn't end with some we're all one race, the human race thing. Is there a problem with that message? No, it's true. It's just like- Just reminds us that we're all a part of the cosmic whole and that it would serve us good to remember that? No, it just, I don't know. I feel like saying that sometimes ignores other people's realities, like the realities that a lot of us have to face. And this one's not about race, it's about gender. Well, not entirely about gender intersections. I well, isn't that as you always say, a yes, video, yes, for, a video another for another day. day. Anyways, thank you very much for your help. I can take it from here. All right. All right, bye girl. Stay mindful. <laughs> oh, you bye. Ash of enlightenment that lasts only three days. But a conscientious... <laughs> she was high. We likely all know how we got here, okay? But I'm just a guy that woke up after 30 years and realized that I was living in a state of conflict. Conflict with who I feel I am in my core, and conflict with who the world tells me as a man I should be. Now, men, <laughs> I'm not saying that everything we've learned is toxic, okay? I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with you or me. And men, I'm not saying we have to stop being men. But we need balance, right? We need balance, and the only way things will change is if we take a, a real honest look at the scripts that have been passed down to us from generation to generation, and the roles that, as men, we choose to take on in our everyday lives. Toxic masculinity isn't real masculinity. It's a performance of masculinity at its worst, and patriarchy fortifies its performance. Under psychological patriarchy, all of us are made to perpetuate and chase this ridiculous version of manhood that requires you to be half a human. If you grow up in a society that teaches you that anything that's feminine is weak and therefore bad, how and why would you want to be related to that? And more importantly, how and why would you even respect something like that? Femininity, not patriarchy. I would like to just add that having a term like toxic masculinity is nice as a catch-all phrase for explaining bad male behavior, but I think after a while it just kind of oversaturates our language like terms like problematic or woke and it just starts to mean less and less to the point where after a while you're like, how do you actually even define toxic masculinity? I'm also just a firm believer that as we grow and as our collective awareness expands more, as our minds develop more, we have a responsibility to think critically about catch-all terms like toxic masculinity and also about older terms like patriarchy and how that system actually works. Um, I think we have a challenge and a responsibility to go deeper. Because yeah, we're most likely not going to get rid of these systems of oppression, but I kind of look at it like marionette dolls. Oh, that's what they're called. I'll put it below if it's not. But basically, you know, we have these strings attached to us and the strings and the hands to me are these systems. And Don Miguel Ruiz talks about in his book, The Four Agreements, how self-awareness is the first step to a spiritual journey. You can't change something that you don't even know is a problem or that you're not even aware of as a thing. So us being aware of the strings in the hand, you know, I think that helps us because the minute we try to say, burn this down, burn this down, I have said it before, I have, but when we are too active in saying those things, it just kind of turns it into a fact that we can just get rid of them and ignores the fact that something more harmful or something more sneaky and more dangerous can come in its place, you know? Like people will say we want to get rid of racism. Yes, we do, but 
we've had so many iterations of revolutions surrounding race because we all wanted to burn it down and change things but thought okay this revolution happened it existed in this time now we're done racism is fixed and meanwhile most people know that it isn't you know so i think being aware of the fact that there's always something more insidious that can come in and take the thing's place and be more sneaky about it with regards to patriarchy i think there's no way to completely rid ourselves of it but to just every day on our micro levels in our individual lives be aware of it we have to be aware of the fact that patriarchy is alive and well it's not just in boardrooms or on television it exists in our minds which means that it's something we can all manage and work on on an individual level every day if i may also be completely vulnerable for a second here i've been struggling a lot this year with hating men and feeling let down by them. It's why I couldn't understand that guy when he was talking about defending men because in every way that I've known men all I've ever wanted was love and connection from them and it's always felt like I couldn't get it. And I don't just mean that in a romantic sense, I mean that from my dad or my brothers or, or male best friends or anything like that. So for the rest of us, I understand if you don't have the patience, cause I didn't. <laughs> I would just ask that you evaluate your own ways, big and small, that you contribute to this system. Especially psychological patriarchy, cause that is. Mm. It's almost too easy at this point to only point the finger at men or say that it's all about overt power because it's about that, yes, but patriarchy goes beyond the outward. Psychological patriarchy is to me, a better term to use than toxic masculinity because yeah, those are the actions that they're doing, but they're not what the real problem is. Anyways, I feel like we all just need to find it in our hearts to have a bit more empathy yeah, for men. Don't hurt me. <laughs> I know it's way easier to empathize with people who you think deserve your empathy. And for a lot of us, we don't think men deserve it because they wreak so much havoc. But I'm here to say, come on, y'all. If we want to start a revolution, if we want to dismantle these power structures, or at least, you know, try to or live with them above our heads, then we got to suck it up and keep trying to talk to these men and, you know, take breaks when you need to, because the shit ain't easy. And for you men out there, you got to start having these conversations with yourself. Have these with your friends. Go to a therapist. A lot of men use their partners as therapists especially if they're dating women, instead of going to an actual licensed therapist to really help them. I'm just saying, think about it. It's, there, there are some resources, some free ones out there. But you gotta do the work yourselves, dudes, because we're tired. God, even making this video, I am tired. But anyway, I wanted to make this video because I find conversations about patriarchy and masculinity and all of these things very interesting. I might do another video talking specifically about black masculinity, not just involving men, but women as well, just black people in general, sorry. I know it was very male, female. Um, but yeah, I just find these conversations very interesting because I'm all about learning about connection and how we connect to each other and the things that stop us from connecting to each other. And patriarchy is one of them. So, you know, nah. <laughs> As always, please feel free to comment below and let me know your thoughts on this video, if you learned anything, if you have something to teach me. You know, she loves to learn. Thanks for making it to the end of this and thanks for your patience because I did not put a video out last week because I just, I wanna make some quality content, you know, and make sure that I'm not just throwing shit out every week, you know? I'm not saying that if you throw shit out every week, it's not quality, um, doesn't matter. Be sure to water your plants and feed your pets. And remember that you can always change your mind because you can. All right, I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.